Gary Parrish reacting to this one. GP, I don't think we had this uh, being the outcome slated between these two, but Michigan State pulls off a big one here at home, a win that they needed mightily as well with things starting to slide the wrong way in a hurry. Our Jerry Palm had them slated as a seven seed coming into the day. This no doubt helps that. What does this result mean for each of these two programs? Well, it's massive for Michigan State because they were one in five in their previous six games. And the next two after this are at Michigan and at Ohio State. So um, you lose this one, you drop to one in six in a seven game span. And then you got two road games coming up where you're probably underdogs in both. That could make you one in nine in a uh, 10 game span. And now you suddenly find yourself in the bubble conversation uh, at Michigan State for the second consecutive year. And anybody who follows college basketball even a little bit understands that Michigan State is not usually a part of the bubble conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, this win, it, it sort of stops all that. It pauses it. It gives them some momentum heading into these final three games um, uh, of the regular season, heading into the Big Ten tournament. Stops the bleeding, if you will. Um, and big, big shot for Tyson Walker at the end of regulation. He doesn't take a lot of threes but he makes them at a great rate. Only takes about two a game, but he's shooting 57% from three uh, on the season. So when he got a good look, he was comfortable taking it. Obviously, he knocked it down. For Purdue, it's just another troubling sign. This is a program that needed a stop in the final seconds to try to go to overtime, and they could not get it, and that should not be surprising because Purdue has not been able to get stops all season. They entered this game ranked uh, 118th in the country in adjusted defensive efficiency, according to Ken Palm. Now, this is a Purdue program that hasn't been to the Final Four since 1980, and this is a Purdue program that has the pieces and the coaching staff, talented enough to get to the Final Four this season, to play in New Orleans um, in the final weekend of the season. But defensively, they are so not good that history suggests them getting there is an unlikely um, scenario. Because I won't bore you with all the numbers, but just trust me when I tell you, when you're ranked outside of the top 110 in adjusted defensive efficiency, um, you're not going to get to the Final Four. I'm not saying it's impossible. I am saying it's highly unlikely best, uh, based on history. You know, Matt Painter has talked about this throughout the season. He is a smart guy. He sees the same numbers I see. He's asked his team to get better. And perhaps they can to some degree but they're clearly not going to be great at any point on the defensive end of the court, and that is going to make them susceptible when they get into the NCAA tournament of being upset. Perhaps not in the round of 64, but as early as the round of 32. Yeah, this one no doubt hurts their chances of ending up on a one line when we do head to tournament time. And you lay out those numbers, and they're always helpful, but this one seemed like an eye test uh, that they failed on Saturday as well. You got two seven-footers. You should be able to bully ball your way to a win here on the road. Is this a roster that, in your opinion, plays smaller uh, than that depth chart reads? Well, Matt Painter has made it clear from the very start of the season that he has two super talented bigs in Trevion Williams and Zach Eady, but he is not going to play them together. Mm -hmm. You know, 20 years ago, I'm certain he would have. Um, but basketball has changed so much in this era that you really can't afford, or at least most coaches don't want to try to play two bigs at the same time. You want to have uh, a power forward, and I put quotes around the word power, but uh, a four-man, if you will, um, who can stretch the floor, who can create space for guards like Jay Nivey. This all trickles down from the NBA. It started there, and now it is very much a part of college basketball. And so what Matt... Uh, and that Purdue staff have been doing is, is playing Trevion Williams and Zach Eady about the same amount of time, but almost never together. I guess it's, you know, reasonable minds could disagree on whether that's a proper approach because, you know, what has always been true in, college, in basketball in general is try to get your best players on the court as much as possible. Well, Purdue does not do that because Zach Eady and Trevion Williams are at least two of the top four players on mm -hmm. that roster, and they're almost never on the court together. Um, it is a notable. It is something that um, has been discussed and talked about all season. But at this point, you know, Purdue plays the way it plays. And, and, and they're going to play, you know, as you put it, small um, outside of that center position um, for the rest of the season, uh, for better or worse. JP, we appreciate you outlining it all for us here on HQ. Thank you, my friend.
And don't forget, there's only one place to be as we grow closer to tourney time. That's with our guys on the Eye on College Basketball podcast. Gary Parrish, Matt Norlander, day in and day out, bringing you all the latest breaking news out of the world of college hoops. Download, subscribe, and join the conversation right now.